Hello, my name is Michele. I'm an astrophysicist at JPL, and I, I, I love to be here today because there's a, there's a wonderful energy out there. So in honor of all the young scientists in the, in the audience here, and uh, out on the mall, and in honor of all the slightly older scientists who have prepared a, an amazing show for them. Uh, today I'm not going to tell you about my research, only a little bit about that, but I'm going to tell you a story about my scientific hero. That's uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and as a grad student, she made a discovery that created an entire field of astronomy, which is the field in which I work now. So what happened? In 1967, Jocelyn Bell Burnell was a grad student at the University of Cambridge, and she was working on measurements from one of the first radio telescopes. She had built this together with other students by stringing together something like uh, 120 miles of wire across a field over a thousand posts. Um, that doesn't look like a radio telescope you may know about, but it's a big antenna, basically. And after they built it, they realized actually that the, they hadn't left enough space for a lawn mower to go between the poles. Um, so uh, what do you think they did? To, to avoid the grass, you know, getting too tall and getting in the way of measurements. Not grad students, they use sheep. They use sheep, this being in England. Okay, so periodically they would let them wander through and do their job on the grass. Anyway, so that this was a different radio telescope than most because it had to do something special. Uh, back then we thought that, uh, uh, scientists thought that uh, any interesting emission from uh, the universe would be very constant and uh, very homogeneous. But with these radio telescopes, they were trying to see time-changing signals. Uh, signals with a, uh, that they change quickly, effectively, because what they wanted to do is to study quasars, the most distant objects uh, in the universe, and to understand their size by way of the flickering of, uh, uh, of the radiation going through the solar wind, going through the solar system. So a radio telescope like, like that, what it produced was uh, basically traces on, on, uh, on a strip, on a paper recorder, and uh, Jocelyn would lay them down on the floor, 30 meters every day at night, and go through it and try to look for signals that look like that, more or less. So there was lots of interference. She, was, she had to find out when uh, you know, things weren't quite astronomical sources, but maybe were transmissions from uh, pirate radio uh, uh, channels or from the police. But she did find lots of quasars. And she also uh, observed something very strange, something that didn't look like uh, uh, the quasars or anything else. This one, CP1919. Uh, this was very interesting. So, um, uh, so she got ready to actually record this with a fast, with a high speed uh, recorder and really look at the structure of it, but the source disappeared. Okay, this from August, she had to wait until November because this thing appeared again. And when it appeared again, she was astonished by what she saw. The source was periodic. It had regular pulses every second and 33, uh, um, every second dot 33. So it was going ping, 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 ping. Now astronomers didn't know about anything that could do that in a universe. Th that was too fast to be going like that. It couldn't be a star. Uh, and in fact, a, a friend of her, another grad student, nicknamed this Little Green Man. <laughs> because <laughs> the idea that the periodic transmissions could actually be from, uh, uh, artif from not artificial, from an intelligent, uh, intelligent beings somewhere across the galaxy. They had shown that this source was coming from the galaxy, not from Earth, not from the solar system. And so there was a question, what was it? So Jocelyn herself was annoyed by the suggestions of the aliens. Uh, actually, she said at the time, look, I'm, I'm just trying to do my PhD here with a new observing technique, and here this little green man come and decide to communicate or, with my antenna and with my radio band. But her advisor took it seriously, and they started to discuss what, what was the responsible thing to do, you know, tell the prime minister in England, because they said, well, I, I think we should just, you know, take this and burn it and not, not tell any, anybody. Because if the public knows about this, they're going to send, try to send a signal out there. And the first time you know, they're going to come here and invade us and eat us. <laughs> okay, they, they were actually able to show that it was not any intelligent life. And the way they did it, uh, two ways, really. One was that intelligent life probably comes from a planet. Planet has to go around the star. Uh, and, and therefore, you'd see the pattern from the orbit of the planet in this kind of emission. They didn't see that. The other thing is they found three more, different parts of the galaxy, uh, different positions at the same frequency. So what was the chance that you know, you'd have all these different civilizations transmitting in the same band uh, in the same way? No way. It had to be, had to be something astrophysical. But what? Okay, a star is too big to pulsate so fast. So you have to look for small stars. 
you, some of you may know that, uh, you know, the sun is a mass of incandescent gas. And uh, so that's what stars do. They, the radiation keeps them from collapsing together, okay? So the light is pushing out against gravity, which wants to muddle things up and to clump them together. Um, when stars, however, run out of fuel, run, run out of the fuel they use for nuclear fusion, they actually collapse. And we've known, uh, astronomers had known for a long time about uh, uh, white dwarfs. So these are stars that have collapsed. A sun will become a white dwarf in many, many million years. Uh, if you collapse the mass of the sun to something like the size of the Earth, uh, you get a star that has uh, uh, such a density that a spoonful, a pea-sized amount of uh, white dwarf, would weigh as much as a pig, 500 pounds. Uh, there's actually a website where you can go and put in a weight, and it tells you what weighs like that. So it's, it's a metaphor making uh, website. Um, if you start with even bigger stars, you'll collapse even closer. So white dwarfs are kept together uh, because the atoms are squashed together and they're only kept apart by the electrons. Not even the electric charge of the electrons is pulling them apart, but the fact that they want to maintain their identity, basically not to get mashed into a single one. So a little bit like cars on the 405, okay, on a, on a bad weekend. Newton's star, they can't even do that. There's so much gravity, it, it pushes together so much that you go down to a density where a spoonful of Newton's star is the same weight as the pyramid of Giza. So, okay, so definitely nature doesn't make this with the same uh, efficiency as Julia uh, Greer does in a, in a lab. <laughs> so very, very dense, mass of the sun, the size of Los Angeles or smaller. And so the metaphor for this actually is that, so, so this is what cars look like in a junkyard compactor after a pile up on the 405, okay? So it's, it's, not a, it's not Chrysler or Ferrari anymore, it's just one thing, it's just a nuclear soup in the Newton star altogether. So these are small. Something like this could actually pulsate or rotate fast enough that you get a signal every second. And in fact, that's what, that's what astronomers and astrophysicists figured out was happening. And it was two of them in particular, Passini and Gold. Uh, they argued that uh, the very strong magnetic field around the Newton star, a rotating one, could generate a very efficient electric engine and therefore accelerate particles and spout them out at the poles. This would make sense for the kind of radio, radio emission that, we, uh, that Jocelyn was seeing. At the same time, if these things are rotating very fast, you get kind of a lighthouse effect. The beam is, the, is at the pole, the star is rotating, so it passes Earth every second if the star is rotating every second. So this was a triumph. It was com confirmed shortly afterwards because a pulsar, as they came to be called, these objects, these pulsating stars, was found at the center of the Crab Nebula, which we know was the result of a stellar explosion. So leaving a Newton star, just that very dense object at the center, and a pulsar, a pulsating Newton star. This was a triumph. It was the beginning of uh, relativistic astrophysics. My field is the field of the most extreme densities of energies and mass of the most uh, unimaginable velocities close to the speed of light and of violent encounters, of, of blinding emissions. You know, you put all these things in grants because it's, uh, the superlatives help you, <laughs> help you motivate people to fund your research. But no, actually, uh, these objects uh, helped us confirm Einstein's theory of gravity to a very high precision. So sorry, Agnes, for the moment. <laughs> Confirmed and actually to detect gravitational waves, to detect a loss of energy due to the emission of gravitational waves, which were then seen directly by LIGO in 2015. And uh, that's an idea of uh, relativistic astrophysics. So what I'm doing right now with these is actually we have, a, we have many, we have dozens of these stars across the galaxy. We can monitor them and their emission is so precise that we can look in variations over the periodicity, over the regular emission, which is a delta sign that gravitational waves, again, are passing through. So this is a little bit like uh, being a, a kind of a galactic spider standing at the Earth and uh, uh, listening or, or feeling for minute vibrations in this net, in this web that you have strung out using pulsars across the galaxy. Now, so what's uh, I should say also, in 1974, a Nobel Prize was given, okay, for the discovery of pulsars, but it was given to Jocelyn's advisor and to his colleague, uh, Ryle, who had uh, designed the, te the observing technique. So she was very gracious about it, but I think, and many thought it would have been very appropriate to give the Nobel Prize to Jocelyn because she had curiosity, she had hard persistence, hard working, and, uh, uh, and she had the imagination. And these are the very qualities that uh, the Nobel Prize is meant to, uh, you know, to, to, to encourage. Okay, so the lesson is then, 
uh, if you can have uh, imagination, if you, can, if you can have the courage to look in places where nobody else has looked, uh, you may be able to see what has not been seen until then, to see the unseen. And for a few moments, a few days, you'll have something in your hands or in, y in your paper that nobody else in the universe, or at least on Earth, has understood or has seen. A little bit like Galileo had the first time, you know, he looked through the telescope and saw the, uh, the phases of Venus. Um, and I like to think that, you know, among all the, the young uh, enthusiasts and scientists uh, that we have today, there is one uh, who will one day, through persistence, hard work, imagination, and luck, will make a discovery that will create an entire new field of science, maybe astronomy, maybe something else. Thank you for coming. Thank you.